Hi there, I'm Elizabeth Putnam. I'm a student nurse at UNCG and I'm going to be presenting a case study about a patient that was under my care um, on the cardiothoracic ICU at Duke Hospital. Um, this patient's case was very unique. She was actually a patient on our unit for several weeks, so I had the pleasure of caring for her many times. Um, unfortunately, she did pass away last week, but um, I had the opportunity to learn about her condition, which was quite fascinating, and I am excited to share it with you all. My patient was a 61-year-old female with a past medical history of aortic stenosis, hyperparathyroidism, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, stroke, and coronary artery disease. She underwent open-heart surgery for aortic valve replacement at an outside hospital in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, there were some unknown complications during her surgery. She actually started hemorrhaging through her chest tubes, her vitals declined, and her heart basically lost all capacity to function independently. Um, she was brought to Duke Hospital because it was necessary to um, put her on some invasive devices that only Duke has the capacity to manage. So, for example, um, she was brought to Duke and placed on a machine called ECMO, which stands for Extracorporeal Membrane Oxygenation. This is a machine that um, provides both respiratory and cardiac um, support for patients who don't have good heart and lung function. So it actually removes blood from your body, oxygenates it, and then pumps it directly back into the right side of your heart through a very large cannula. Um, as soon as my patient arrived on the unit, her chest was reopened and, um, you know, the surgeon tried to find the source of the bleed to be able to stop it. She was then placed on ECMO, a ventilator, and an intra-aortic balloon pump that would help to perfuse her coronary arteries. Um, she was given several units of blood and started on some medications that would help to restore blood flow to her vital organs. When I first assessed her, she was oriented times four, but she had some generalized weakness and required full assistance with her ADLs. Her respirations were fully dependent on the ventilator, so the rate and rhythm were regular and unlabored. Um, but her breast sounds were very ronkerous. She had crackles, and it was clear that she had some fluid on her lungs. Um, she had a pacemaker that was pacing her heart at 90 beats per minute, normal S1, S2 heart sounds. Um, she did have an occasional PVC, and she had a pericardial friction rub, which is normal after heart surgery due to the swelling of the heart. Her pulses were weak and thready. Um, she'd been on vasoactive medications for several weeks at this point. As you probably know, vasoactive medications like dopamine and epinephrine work to um, shunt blood away from your periphery and towards your vital organs. So the perfusion to her feet was very poor. Um, her toes were already black and necrotic. She had mid-sternal chest incision from her surgery, um, and it was clear that she was in continuous pain from her surgery as well as um, just from being bedridden for several weeks. She was very stiff. Um, and she had hypoactive bowel sounds <clears throat> despite being on a bowel regimen and a Foley that was draining a significant amount of urine due to her schedule of furosemide. Um, she seemed really distraught and um, kind of fearful. And many times I would walk into the room and, and she would just be in tears. Um, so she was not in a great place psychologically. Excuse me, I have a head cold, so I'm going to be sipping on tea so I don't have a coughing spell. <laughs> Um, as for her vitals, her temperature, um, she was febrile. She had a low grade fever, about 99 to 100 for most of her hospital stay. Um, <coughs> MAPS 75 to 85, CVP 3 to 7. Her heart rate was paced at 90 from her pacemaker. Um, respirations were set at 16 on the vent. Um, O2 SATs 99 to 100. And as for her pain, like I said, continuous and ongoing, um, anywhere from a three for, you know, at good times all the way up to a 10. Um, I'm going to start off by going through some of her IV and oral medications to help you kind of get a better understanding of the pathophysiology behind her disease and um, how we as nurses use medications to treat them. All of her IV medications were infusing through a central line in her right jugular vein, and all of her oral medications were being administered through a nasogastric tube. <clears throat> so patients with central lines often have several medications going into the same port. So a carrier is some type of crystalloid fluid like um, normal saline, lactated ringers that's used to 
kind of dilute stronger medications and flush them through the IV line to make sure that the patient's getting the full amount. So in this case, D5W was being used as a carrier. Um, dopamine, epinephrine, and vasopressin <clears throat> were being used in combination. So in this case, all of these medications are being used as inotropes, which are similar to digoxin, <clears throat> in order to improve the <clears throat> contractility of the heart in patients with heart failure. So <clears throat> on ICU, any combination of these drugs are known as rocket fuel. And it is called rocket fuel because if you have to combine, combine these sympathomimetic drugs to um, keep the patient's heart rate and force the contraction within normal limits, then they're essentially relying on these vasoactive meds to um, perfuse their vital organs. So she was also on a heparin drip to prevent blood clots from forming inside the ECMO tubing. Um, she was on many oral medications, but a few of the significant ones were <clears throat> acetaminophen for fever, aspirin for her coronary artery disease. Um, she was on a statin for her hyperlipidemia. She was on atropine for some of those ectopic beaks she was having, like the PVCs. Um, and she was on a combination of epigen, um, iron, and folic acid because she had iron deficiency anemia and she was already having problems with oxygenation. Um, she was also on an insulin drip. So patients on inotropic drugs like um, epinephrine and dopamine are often hyperglycemic because these effects cause or these medications cause the liver to produce excess glucose um, and that can cause infection. So um, we monitor CBGs often and administer insulin. Um, so I'm going to move on to fluid and electrolyte and acid base balance. Every patient on the ICU is um, on strict INO monitoring precautions because most of them are hemodynamically unstable. <clears throat> so my patient had an indwelling Foley and we measured her output every single hour. Um, she was being diuresed with furosemide, so her urine output was either equal to or greater than her fluid intake on most days. Um, because she was on furosemide, we um, really closely monitored her electrolytes, her um, potassium, sodium, and magnesium were usually within normal limits, but if one value became abnormally low, we would, you know, supplement it and then continue to monitor them. Her mucous membranes were moist, skin turgor was normal, there was no edema visible anywhere in her body. Um, <clears throat> the vasoactive medication she was on, um, like I said, they can cause hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia um, poses a risk for infection as well as delayed wound healing. So um, my patient had led several large surgical wounds um, as well as lots of invasive lines and monitoring devices. So we kept very tight control over her blood sugar to um, make sure that she could heal properly and without infection. For this reason, my patient was on an insulin drip, so we measured her blood pressure <coughs> very frequently and then titrated her insulin accordingly. <clears throat> As for her acid-base balance, ABGs are drawn daily um, to check for CO2, oxygen, and bicarbonate in the blood. Um, because she was on a ventilator, she did not have many problems with ABGs because her respirations were being controlled, um, CO2 end tidal was being controlled, um, she never had any episodes of vomiting and diarrhea that may have led to a metabolic imbalance. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to um, touch on perfusion and oxygenation next because it's closely related to um, fluid and electrolyte and acid-base balance. Um, and also because perfusion and oxygenation were this patient's biggest issues. Um, like I mentioned earlier, she suffered complications during her surgery that um, led to um, you know, her heart and lungs being unable to work properly. So she wasn't able to oxygenate her blood. She was placed on ECMO and a ventilator. Um, over the several weeks that I cared for her, I noticed that the necrosis in her feet was worsening um, the longer that she was on these IV medications that was shunting the blood away from her periphery. So the nursing diagnosis in this situation is ineffective perfusion, specifically to her feet. 
Um, so, you know, we tried some non-pharmacologic interventions like hot packs and massage to kind of maintain that blood flow to her feet. But, um, unfortunately her heart was so reliant on these medications to, um, keep her vital organs perfused and we were unable to wean them. So, um, her body just really couldn't keep up and eventually her toes became so necrotic that they detached on their own, um, because the family had previously refused amputation. So, um, yes, her, her toes fell off. Um, you know, as nurses, we did all that we could do to prevent that necrosis, but perfusion was such a problem with this patient that, um, we were unable to prevent it from happening. Um, I'm going to move on to immunity and infection. Um, my patient was at high risk for infection because she had a Foley she just had a very invasive surgery. She was bed fast, intubated, <clears throat> et cetera. For this reason, the nurses were required to do neurochecks every four hours to monitor for <coughs> delirium that often presents with infection in the elderly and um, draw CBC every hour to monitor her white blood cell count. <clears throat> so to prevent pressure ulcers and infection that can stem from those, she was turned every two hours placed on pillow support to alleviate the pressure on her sacrum. Um, there was one day I was caring for her that um, her temperature rose to 100.6 and her white blood cell count rose to 16 just overnight. Um, her values went up and we had no idea why. Um, those values stayed elevated for several days and in response to her fever, she was placed on acetaminophen, but her body had no response to that and she continued to be febrile. Um, so to cool her, some of the nursing interventions we did were um, alcohol baths once a day, which I had never heard of um, before this clinical rotation. I thought that was interesting, as well as um, we placed ice packs over the areas of her body that get the most blood flow, like under your arms, over your abdomen, in between your legs. Um, because her fever and white blood cell count were still elevated, a combination of Zinesef and vancomycin were administered IV. Um, and after several days on these medications, she eventually became afebrile and her count returned to normal. So we just continued to monitor her. Um, so hemorrhage versus clotting. Um, this patient was completely immobile for several weeks. Um, so she was at high risk for blood clots. Um, after heart surgery, blood products like RBCs, plasmas, um, platelets and clotting factors are given to prevent the patient from hemorrhaging, but <clears throat> that can actually backfire and cause the patient to develop DVTs um, because, you know, these surgical patients are immobile. Um, so to prevent my patient from getting DVTs, I placed her on sequential de compression devices continuously. Um, I mentioned earlier that she was on a continuous heparin drip to further prevent blood clotting, and that was titrated based on a PCT level that was drawn every day. Um, the PTT goal for this patient was between 50 and 60, and that is to keep her blood nice and thin, but not too thin that she was going to hemorrhage out of her lines and wounds. Um, like I said, a PTT was drawn every day, and if it was not between 50 and 60, then, um, the heparin was titrated accordingly. <clears throat> so I already touched on mobility and body alignment. This patient was bed fast. She had generalized weakness poor range of motion in all of her extremities. Um, a lot of her mobility and body alignment issues are attributable to her comorbid conditions. Um, before the surgery, she was, you know, 61 years old, very active. She had no issues with mobility. And so after her surgery, I think that she would have been able to recover had it gone appropriately. But um, I think with her condition, she was just so weak. She was never really able to regain her strength, and the longer she laid in bed, the more muscle tone, <coughs> excuse me, and flexibility was lost, and eventually she was just rendered completely immobile. Um, so to try to combat this, um, the nurses worked closely <coughs> with physical therapy. Um, she had a PT consult that would come in and do passive range of motion exercises with her. Despite this, um, her mobility continued to decline. Um, and at the end of her life, she was in so much pain that I think that the anxiety 
you know, really got to her and it scared her to move. And so then she was just completely unable to move. Um, <clears throat> so our interventions were centered around reducing the risk of impaired skin integrity. So turning her every two hours, keeping her bottom clean, uh, making sure she was never laying on any wires or caps that so often get lost in the bed. <laughs> um, as for pain, during my initial assessment of this patient, I could tell that pain was going to be a tremendous issue um, for her. She had menstrual chest pain from her surgery because they have to um, physically break the sternum to reach the heart. She had pain from several large chest tubes um, being used to prevent fluid buildup from around her heart and lungs. <clears throat> she had pain at various sites where her lines and wound backs had been inserted and removed. And then she had just pain from that stiffness and immobility. Um, there were several times when she rated her pain score a 10 out of 10, but she could never get below a three, even with narcotics. Um, she was on scheduled Tylenol for several reasons, including pain, but then she also had IV oxycodone and, um, fentanyl. Um, so whenever her pain score was above baseline, we administered a narcotic that would allow her pain to kind of return back to baseline. Um, as far as non-pharmacologic nursing interventions go for pain, um, we used heat and cold therapy on her wounds and drain sites. Um, <clears throat> and at the end of her life, <coughs> um, my patient was so frustrated, so tense, so done with having to lay in a bed all day, every day, that um, I think that the mental anxiety of that increased her pain further to a point that was um, just unbearable for her. So as we withdrew care on her, we placed her on a hydromorphone drip, which is commonly known as Dilaudid. Um, and this eased her pain tremendously, um, and made her calm and comfortable, which I was very pleased with. Um, the nutritional re requirements for this patient were very different from those of the general population. Um, when I assessed her, she had hypoactive bowel sounds. Um, her abdomen was soft and rounded, and she was having regular bowel movements despite those hypoactive sounds. Um, so we didn't have to implement any interventions based on elimination problems, but we did have to put her on some prophylactic medications to um, prevent constipation from opioids and immobilization. <clears throat> um, as for her nutritional intake, she was NPO throughout her entire hospital stay um, because she was intubated and that comes with a high risk for aspiration pneumonia. Um, <clears throat> so she was on continuous tube feeds called impact peptide and that was being administered through an NG tube. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so as for interdisciplinary, this patient was... Um, you know, she had a very large treatment team surrounding and surrounding her and providing her care. Um, she underwent a lot of procedures that nurses are not very familiar with. So um, the the responsibility of education kind of shifted from being mainly the responsibility of the nurse to being a shared responsibility <clears throat> by every team member. So her treatment team cons consisted of an attending physician, a surgeon, a nutritionist, a pharmacist, a nurse practitioner, and then several nurses that rotated so that this patient would have some continuity of care, having been in the hospital for several months. Um, I had the opportunity to work closely with several disciplines, and that kind of helped me to um, appreciate the concept of holistic care. Um, as for growth and development, I'd like to reference um, Erickson's theory of growth and development because I think that it really applies to this patient case as she was nearing the end of her life. Um, so <clears throat> the theory, I'm sorry, the stage that would apply to this patient is um, integrity versus despair. So Erickson's theory allows nurses to um, evaluate a patient's developmental level based on certain points, you know, at certain points throughout their life. So in my patient's case, she was nearing the end of her life. And during the week she had spent at the hospital, she had gradually come to terms with the possibility that she was not going to survive. Um, she had said her goodbyes to her family members. And in the end, it was her own decision to withdraw care on herself. Um, she was able to look back on her life with integrity, um, despite the fact that the decline of her health was totally unexpected. Um, she didn't expect that she would go into surgery and all these complications would arise, um, but she didn't blame anyone. She wasn't angry at anyone, and she just kind of 
accepted her fate and decided that she was just too tired to go on and she was ready to pass. Um, but I am so happy to have had the opportunity to care for her. Um, I'm proud of the care that I provided. Um, I was honored to be a part of her treatment team and happy that I was able to console her and her family during a time of such difficulty. So um, I hope that you learned as much as I did from this patient. And um, I look forward to hearing your case studies. I know that this one was a little bit complex because of all the machinery she was on and the pathophysiology behind her disease. But um, I hope that it was beneficial for you. Thank you.